Uh, I think uh, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, managing cash for our startups. Uh, as you know, uh, cash is king in this business. If you run out of cash, you run out of uh, uh, fuel and you do a lot of business. Uh, so it's something that uh, every startup uh, really needs to uh, pay big attention to. And uh, it should be something that, uh, that should be on your mind when you go to bed. It's something uh, the same thing in mind when you wake up uh, if you're running a startup. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Chuck. Uh, I'm a Malaysian that I've been, uh, I've been living in the US uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, I, uh, as my background, I am a developer. Uh, I used to build operating systems for uh, Wall Street banks. And then uh, in 2008, uh, when the world was crashing down, I moved to California to join uh, a startup called Loop. Uh, uh, and uh, we were uh, pretty well funded by Sequoia NEA. Uh, and eventually uh, we exited uh, in uh, 2012. And I'm also a mentor with uh, five startups. Uh, so here's a little exercise to do uh, before we go into the material. So uh, imagine you are founding a new revolutionary startup. So how much do you think you need to raise? Uh, what was an acceptable amount to raise? Uh, how are you going to allocate the funds? Where is the money going to go to? And uh, what you should not be spending money on? So I'm going to give you guys a minute, uh, think about it, and then I'm uh, going to take some feedback from you. Okay, uh, so any volunteers? Uh, how much should you raise? No? Unlimited? Yeah. Alright, hold on. A thousand. A thousand ringgit. Five thousand. Five hundred thousand. Well, I'm getting more expensive. So, the Runa raised money in US dollars. Don't, don't talk to investor in the <laughs> Okay, uh, how, how would you allocate your money? What, you know, it's actually you know, a very common question. If you go to the investor and say, I want to raise a million dollars, if the investor is somehow sophisticated, you know, the question would be, how, what are you going to do with the money? So, uh, Swiss bank account? Uh, hire, you know, hire designers, developers, so what, what, how are you paying money? Anyone's not through fundraising? No? MVP, so allocate 100% of the development. Okay, uh, how about the other one? 40-50% of the development. So what are you going to spend the rest of the money? Testing or paying for advertising? So marketing costs, mar marketing is average. Okay, good, good. Uh, what should you not spend money on? Everything not project related, like showing expensive Silicon Valley star parties with the tigers and money. Hi, Stalin. If you're in the salon, start up with the new hair salon. Okay, let's go into the field. So earlier we talked about you know, how much should you aim to raise, uh, what's an acceptable range. Uh, but the first question you should ask is, you know, uh, I think maybe this is a, if you haven't raised money before, uh, many first time entrepreneurs do ask me, uh, you know, can I, I have an idea, do you think I'm able to raise some money uh, based on my idea alone? And uh, usually my answer is uh, extremely difficult, unless, 
unless you have a startup that sold multiple companies in the past and made a lot of money for your investors. Uh, we, we have a client actually that uh, you know, they, uh, they sold their company that eventually became MSN Gaming Zone uh, and sold a few other companies. So when they decided to create a HTML5 gaming company, they were able to raise 12 million US dollars in one month. This is the idea. Uh, we also have another client uh, who the CEO is a pretty senior person at Google, uh, able to raise 30 million dollars uh, on an unlaunched product. So this happens a lot in Silicon Valley, uh, where people can raise money from ideas. Uh, but down to earth, uh, in many other places, it's a lot harder to do. Um, so, um, you know, if you truly believe in the idea, uh, I would say, uh, you know, if I'm an investor, I want to make sure that you've seen the game. Uh, you know, not just giving money and then just throwing it away. Uh, and one way to prove seeing the game is uh, maybe to stop on bootstrapping. Uh, putting some of your money in uh, to prove that you truly believe. If you don't believe in the idea enough, uh, that you won't even put your own money in, why would I as an investor put money in your startup? Uh, another way is uh, after you know, your own money, then friends and family. You know, can you convince your friends and families to put money in your idea? Um, there, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one thing is validation. If, uh, you know, if even your friends and family don't believe in your idea enough to put money in, then maybe you have to reconsider is that idea worth pursuing or not. Uh, but it's also good practice, you know, uh, if, you're able, if you're not able to convince your friend and family to put money in you, how can you convince a VC or an investor who's a total stranger uh, to put money in you? Um, so assuming uh, you put your money in, you're able to build uh, your bootstrap, uh, build a first version of your MVP, uh, then it should show some traction. So the next question is now you're ready to go out talk to a bunch of angel investors, seed investors. And now, the other question, how much should we raise? Uh, it's always a very tough question. There's no right answer. Um, but there are a couple, you know, couple of things to consider. Uh, one thing is, uh, don't raise too much too quickly before you find the right product right market fit. So here, here's the reason behind it. The more you raise, the higher the investor expectation is going to be. This is true. You know, if you go after, you know, at the seed stage, you go after a big VC, you raise $50 million. You, the, the VC is going to have very high expectations on you delivering essentially outsized growth or gains or results. And, uh, you know, if you haven't proven your model, uh, you know, and if you happen to raise that big amount of money, then you're going to be under pressure to essentially take, you know, outside risk that may not be in the benefit of, you know, uh, the long term of your business. And I'll talk more about the, the reasoning behind it. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I've seen so many startups where they raise just enough money to get, uh, so all the money goes towards the development of the MVP, just enough for it. And after they're done developing, uh, they run out of money. And when they actually go out, there's no money for customer acquisition, no money for marketing, no money for testing. And when they get feedback, they have no money uh, to uh, eat, you know, kind of uh, iterate and evolve the application. So this is also a common mistake many uh, first-time entrepreneurs make. So what you want to make sure is that you, you allocate your funds very, very efficiently, making sure that you, you have enough money left. Uh, because, you know, no, but, uh, unless you're a Steve Jobs, you know, Nobody get the right, the get the product right the first time. You get the product out there, and I, you know, majority of the time you will be testing it with you, real users, get real feedback, and then you need to have the uh, the runway to iterate on feedback. Uh, so this is something uh, you know, something to, to to think about. And then earlier I was talking about like, don't don't waste too much money. Why why do I not waste too much money too early on? Um, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, and the VCs would not, you know, would, would not uh, always agree with me. Um, a, a VC or invest, uh, you know, especially someone who met, uh, invests in portfolio of companies, their priorities do not always, you know, most of the time they're fully aligned with you, but they do not always align with your priorities. Because if you think about a VC investor, especially if they're putting money in you know, different industries, different places, they're trying to optimize for their portfolio. 
they want you know they want to create some of the unicorns you know and then but to in order to achieve that um, you know uh, the, the, the expectation may be that you get pushed by the investor to take uh, you know a much bigger risk much faster than before your company is ready to, to do it. But for them it's fine because for the investors they are fully okay writing off that the entire investment. But for you as an entrepreneur, you're essentially putting your life on hold for a couple of years. You know, working 80 hour weeks, uh, you know, living on a ramen uh, diet uh, to, to prove, you know, to, to build your business. And for you it's a do a die game. But for investors, not, not always necessary. Uh, they're okay with you failing as long as they optimize the entire portfolio. So you need to make sure, uh, you know, um, when you're raising money, uh, to think about, you know, to, to consider all, all these variables. Uh, and then uh, one more thing is, uh, you know, one of the same many startups make is, uh, you know, after raising one round, they go on to development, test the product and everything. And you wait until you have, uh, like, three months left in your money in the bank before you go out and fundraise. And that's where many startups, you know, get in trouble. Um, you know, just because the first time you raise, you know, the environment will be good, you're able to close your round in two months, doesn't mean that it's always going to be that easy. Raising money is very, very hard. Uh, you're going to get a lot of rejections, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, before, before you get uh, you know, the first yes. Uh, but then usually uh, there's always investors, you know, despite you know, them saying how sophisticated they are, they're all humans at the end of the day. So as humans, we are always, we always have formal fear of missing out. So the moment they see, oh, this few investors are putting money here, there must be something here. Uh, so the moment you get probably your first two checks, first two commitments, getting the third, the fourth, and fifth uh, gets a lot easier sometimes. Um, but to get the first one is really hard. So you want to make sure that you allocate, give yourself enough runway uh, before you run out of money to go out and, and start raising money. You know, fundraising is a full-time job. Uh, many people, many entrepreneurs don't realize it. So imagine yourself, you know, you have a full-time job raising money, you have a full-time job uh, building and improving your product, and a full-time job recruiting and managing your team. So you literally have three jobs. So you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time, you know, to 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 uh, to you know, get the next round before you run out of money and have to lay off lay off yourself. Um, then the next part is, uh, you know, when should I focus on custom acquisition? You mentioned earlier, you know, uh, how much how much you allocate your funds? Typically, the way I see it, uh, you should allocate fifty percent towards development and fifty percent towards marketing and custom acquisition. Many times startups focus so much, put so much of the money allocated into development that uh, you lose sight of how important it is to spend marketing. So marketing becomes second father to development, which is, which is I, I think it's a flawed uh, uh, strategy. So always make sure that you, you, you always reserve you know, half for user acquisition and custom acquisition. And then uh, another uh, mistake startups make is uh, they never think about customer acquisition until the MVP is done. Until the app is pushed to the app store, then you start thinking, okay, uh, how should I find my first 200 users? And this is always a problem uh, because you always have this mentality that you know, if I build something, they will come. And if I build a great product, they will come. And after I spent all my money in uh, six months building the product, nobody came. Uh, you look at your app store download every day, you're lucky you have 10, 10 downloads and everything, then you're like, oh, now you start to panic. No users, and what's wrong? So uh, we're working with a lot of startups where those that have big success always think about the uh, user acquisition from day one, even before they finish designing or building the product. Uh, because you want to have this, so what, what, you know, the way I think about it is you have this, uh, you know, uh, when, we, when I, uh, you know, work with clients, we put out our, our office glass, we draw, uh, who are our typical users? Describe who is the user. So if I'm doing a photo social ad, uh, my user, uh, uh, and, and I focus on, you know, YouTube stars, so my users are young teenage girls between the age of 13 to 18, uh, who watches 
you know, blah, blah, this, 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 you could tell whatever it is, and spend how many hours on YouTube. And this users, where do they go? Where are the eyeballs? Uh, well, they, they would uh, watch this channel on YouTube, they would read these blogs, and they would go to these websites. So now that you know who your users are, where, they, where their eyeballs are, you know, then you start formulating your user acquisition strategy. How do I reach them? If they read uh, you know, this, this influencer, influential blogger that talks about you know, uh, a particular subject, who are your users, then can you convince the blogger to write about your app, your product? Uh, can you pay them? Can you put advertising there? You know, uh, can you, should you advertise on YouTube? Should you advertise on Twitter, Facebook, you know, Google, SEO, or whatever it is? So from day one, you should be thinking about this even before your version is out. Uh, one thing that uh, some of our successful clients have done is they create this fake product page. So uh, one of our clients uh, uh, has a, you know, it's like a blue apron for organic food. So uh, it's like you, you subscribe and pay a fixed amount every week, and they send you a box of uh, groceries, everything pre you know pre made. You just have to put it in and cook it. So you get to try different recipes every single every single week. So before they had an actual, before they even had any groceries, they start creating a, a fake website that features their product, that talks about everything, as though it's, it's finally working. So they then you click on it, you subscribe, they indicate your name, all your information, and then they tell you, oops, we haven't supported your zip code yet. Uh, you are being put in the list uh, for uh, to be notified uh, when, when we, we come to your area. So what they do with this is they start buying you know, $50, $100 Facebook ads. Uh, and they try different ads, uh, different messages. They try different images, you know, putting a, a picture of a housewife, and putting a, a guy, trying different things. And then you start to test what messages convert better. Um, so doing these little experiments uh, you know, uh, will give you better confidence that once your product is ready, you know exactly what's the best strategy to go after your users, and that's when you really ramp up uh, your user acquisition strategy. And that has worked out actually very, very good for them. Um, uh, some people in the, in the kind of the lean startup the methodology, they call it the concierge entity, uh, which is you know, getting something up to free and trying to see how many people uh, signed up. Uh, if you're building an app, uh, you know, before your app is launched, you can you know, put up uh, landing pages to say, you know, to, to say what the app does, make it exclusive, you know, sign up to be invited to our exclusive private data, you know. Like, you know, those of you that go to clubs, usually you see there's a long line outside the club, there must be something good. So, you know, make it sound as though your app is there, you're coming in private, invited to data. Uh, and say, do the same thing, you know, advertise, you know, uh, send out messages, and see what messages convert better for you. Uh, because you're going to make a lot of mistakes, you're going to do a lot of messages and realize that no one signs up, no one actually comes. And it's good to know this upfront uh, before you spend all the money developing the app. Uh, you'll know it by then. Uh, and then if, you're, if, you're, if you want to be a B startup, how do you acquire customers? Uh, you know, on uh, pre 1.0, uh, we actually do work with both startups that actually manage to get LOIs, commitments from potential enterprise clients. Uh, before the product is even done, uh, you you can uh, what you know with uh, we, we do a lot of user experience and visual design, designing the products, and we use a tool called Envision, and even a, as a mobile version. So in one of the projects that we did, uh, we actually you know put we designed a clickable prototype on on the phone, and our client actually went to pitch to the CEO of Burberry, put the phone in front of the CEO. He looked at it and he was actually he thought it was actually a fully functioning app. Like this bunch of wireframes picking around. Uh, so doing things like this early on, you know, going out and start selling your know, product marketing allows you to figure out, you know, you start doing early experiments to see how the best way to pitch to B2B clients. Uh, and if you're able to get commitment, you know, you can say, you know, we're coming out in five weeks, you know, eight weeks, you know, you're gonna be one of our very first users to use this if you sign up now. See if you can come in there. If you cannot, then uh, you know, re revisit your marketing message. You know, is there a better way to tweak it so that it's more effective? Uh, or maybe you're doing, you're doing the wrong product. 
So if you didn't know early on before you actually you know, uh, like go ahead and do it. Um, and then um, once your product is up, work your network. You know, uh, if you're know, building an app that serves uh, small and medium-sized businesses, look into your LinkedIn, you know, look at your Facebook, see which, of, which one of your friends are running small and medium-sized businesses. I did the right fit. Uh, when I started my business, I literally pinged uh, all my friends who in the startup space. Uh, to say, hey, can I help you guys? Can I help you guys? Uh, start with your network, and then, then after that, start to grow your network. Start to attend, uh, you know, uh, uh, conferences, meetups, roadshows. So you want to see who your tri who are your potential customers, what conferences they go to. Uh, do some research about them before you go to the conference. Uh, if you possible, try to set up a meeting with them when they are at the conference, or just stop them at the conference. Uh, another approach that has been very successful, or uh, we've done very successful for B2B businesses is uh, email outreach. So I'm not sure, like some of you, do you, you get uh, emails uh, every week from, you know, like, hi, I'm a company in India, in Eastern Europe. It's a 5 page email. And then the first thing you do is you market a spam for you. But what we don't know is actually uh, there are a lot of other companies that manage to use email marketing and email sales very, very effectively. So instead of spamming everybody, or, you know, if you read an email, you know that, you know, they probably send it to a thousand people. And if they're lucky, you know, they get the name right instead of coming somewhere else. Uh, but there are actually effective ways to do email marketing uh, very, uh, very effectively. Uh, doing things like writing uh, very concise, short emails to the point and making it relevant to the person you're going after. Um, and there are actually a lot of email automation tools out there that you can use successfully. It allows you to create templates. So you are still able to do pretty mass blasting, but the person receiving the email may think that you're actually writing personally specifically for her. So there are a lot of tricks uh, to do things like that. And then there are tools that allow you to, it, it scans your mailbox, so if someone doesn't, so we use a tool called uh, Outreach.io. Uh, there are other tools like Top App, uh, there are many others that uh, allows you the tool to scan, and you can set to say, you know, if uh, after two days you don't hear a response, send a follow-up, automated follow-up. And what we've noticed is actually the majority of our response comes uh, from the follow-up emails. So if you do a message, it's right the first time. Uh, you get their attention, but of course they are people are usually busy. So they say, yeah, and they move on to other emails. But after a couple of days when you follow up, then they're like, yeah, if you, if you leave a personal impression, chances are they'll be like, yeah, I actually remember these guys. Now I finally, you know, I should send you a meeting with them. I should reply to them and reach out. Uh, but last, lastly, last but not least, you know, just go out and meet people. <laughs> Great question. Uh, that's a little trick that we have uh, that we, we do. Uh, there are uh, tools out there. Uh, so usually you start by LinkedIn and you see who you're going after, find people. Uh, and then sometimes if they're in your network, sometimes they're in your email, you list them in LinkedIn. But if not, just do a Google search. There are tools out there that allows you to, uh, uh, they're called mail testers. So you can put their first name, their last name, do a few combinations of them and add their company to your name. And uh, if it happens to be one of the emails in the database, they'll be like, yeah, this email is done. So there are a lot of tricks up there that you can do. Uh, that you can go just Google it. And uh, you know, uh, there, are ways, there are many ways to, 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 to reach people. Um, and, uh, but the most important thing I find is like, you know, I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, and you know, they, they, you know, email is one thing. But nothing beats actually you, uh, you know, trying to set up. Uh, or you do, you know, you, you get a meeting, you do a Skype call, you do a phone call. Uh, but I, I can tell you nothing beats, you know, saying, hey, can we meet in person to grab coffee? Uh, you know, you, the relationship, uh, even in the US where it's more result driven versus relationship driven, you'd be surprised at how effective it is when you actually meet someone in person uh, and uh, actually, you know, uh, you know, get to speak to them, put them in the eye. Uh, you have a much higher chance of uh, closing a deal. And actually, my company we have actually run experiments on this report. I, I have a big BD guy in New York office that all he sits down all day to send emails, do schedule conference calls. 
Whereas for me, uh, I, I do more, more of the in-person meetings. And we do see the differences where uh, we are able to post a lot more views uh, by meeting in person uh, than by just doing pure conference calls. Uh, so for if you're a B2C startup, uh, I know if you launch this launch a new app, uh, first thing you do is uh, scan all your friends on Facebook, Twitter, email, and say, hey, uh, come on, give me a chance, uh, come use my app. Tell me what you think. That's your, your first level. And then it's like, hey, if you like it, uh, you tell your other friends. So if you, you, if you truly build a great app, a great product, uh, and your friends like it, word will start to spread. Uh, we have some clients that they're like, oh, I'm so amazed. Uh, you know, I got reached out by this, this, this guy and say, uh, ask him, how do you find out about this? It's like, oh, my, this other friend, or this other friend. So if you have a great product, uh, once you reach out to the network, a few things to spread. If you have a lousy product, then uh, you quickly realize that besides your circle of friends, no one else is going to download or use it. So then you need to know, you know, what should I do about it? Should I keep it or should I try something else? Um, so I thought earlier about developing user personas. So now that you have the app, now who are, who are the people I'm going after? Uh, I call it chasing the eyeball, just trying to figure out how to reach them. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, yeah, uh, go to forums, social media, YouTube, figure out what's the best channel to uh, distribute your app. Uh, distribution is very, very important. Then going back to money, uh, what should you avoid uh, spending money on, especially at this stage? Uh, number one, too many features. Uh, I see that all the time. Uh, people have brand visions, and the founder will say it has to have A, B, C, D, D, do all this, otherwise, you know, no one's going to use the app. Uh, if you notice a lot of successful apps, uh, they, they, they tend to uh, take away simplicity. Sometimes it does one thing, it does one thing very, very well. And sometimes if you have too many features in the app, I notice that users actually get confused. Because if a user cannot, you know, in within two seconds in their mind, think about, okay, what does this app do? They're not going to use the app. Because it will not cross their mind. So one example, think about Uber or Grab Taxi. I need to get a car. I use it, and that's the only thing it does. Simple as that. So every time I think about getting a car, that comes in my mind. But if your app does a million things, it gets a car, and you know, uh, uh, over there you can uh, you know, uh, uh, pick all the different, uh, you know, can set up the bars and can get this and that. Then it gets very, very confusing to the users. Uh, but if you start with one thing and do it very, very well, people know you, they love your product, and they're very, very loyal, then that's when you can start to add other bells and whistles to it. Uh, there's an app called Lux in uh, San Francisco that I love. It's, uh, you know, you, you drive a car in San Francisco, finding parking is very hard. So they have ballet on the this like Uber. You hit the button, uh, and the guy on the map, really, on a, in a skateboard or on a scooter, actually comes to your car, picks up the car, you put his scooter in the trunk, and then he drives away. And once you're done with the meeting, your meal, or everything, you hit the button, they deliver the car to exactly where you want. Simple. Thus, one function does it very well. And then recently, I was back in San Francisco, I used the app again. Now, when they take my car away from me, I have few options. I can ask them to fill up the patrol. Uh, they can go do an all change for me. Uh, or if I, you know, if I don't have a great time, have too much to drink, uh, uh, they can actually someone can actually drive the car for me. Or I can just pick up the next day. So they start adding a lot of you know, related features around it. But if you know, if it, from day one you pack all these features together, uh, you know, it's it's hard to educate the users as to what does it actually. Is your app more of uh, they drive a car for you? Is that the focus? Or is it about you know, people having to fill out the flow or they take a car for a change? No, the, the core feature is uh, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a ballet service, a uh, concept ballet service, and you know very well. Uh, another example is Amazon. Uh, know, those of you in the 30s will remember if you're in the 30s and you get it. When Amazon first started, they do one thing and one thing only. They're an online bookstore, they sell, they ship books to you. And I still remember when I was in secondary school at the time, uh, actually after secondary school, I, I went to study in the US, and you still cannot order Amazon books from Malaysia. So I would have uh, Malaysian friends that once I was on Amazon, I'd ask them to bring the books back again when I go back. And that was how Amazon started. But then after that, people got hooked, and then they start adding more and more product. 
And today, Amazon is the place where anything you can think of, anything you want to buy, you type it there, chances are it, it shows up. With all kinds of variety that you can get anywhere else. But imagine going to Amazon sort of out, you know, selling all kinds of stuff. How would people perceive that? You know, how, what, you know, uh, what, uh, it's the first time, you know, you'd be like, what does Amazon do? You know, what should I use Amazon for? Before you know much about Amazon. Um, so another thing to avoid spending money on is over automation. Um, I talk a lot uh, on uh, concierge and the concept of concierge and VP, which is on the front end, you know, you build something flashy, and everything looks cool, that's fully really working. But when the user hit the button, uh, you have a bunch of minions at the back running around, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, shuffling papers. So there's, for example, there's a company, financial company that I met for. Uh, they uh, assign uh, you know, any college student that has a question of math, geometry, whatever it is. Uh, they can ask the question and then a, a, a mentor gets assigned. So they have 20,000 mentors that get assigned to answer the questions for them. Uh, so as a concierge and VP, uh, you know, one way people think about it, I'm going to build this sophisticated algorithm that's going to do the natural language processing. So every time someone asks a question, the computer is able to pass the message and figure out who's the right mentor to do it. And that's going to cost you a lot of money to do it. Probably back up before you're done. Uh, whereas if you go the concierge and VP approach, uh, you're going to assume at the beginning, maybe I'm going to get 100 users a day. So I'm going to have a lot of interns, minions sitting around, and someone asks a question, and the minions read the message, and then manually email the right uh, mentor to answer the question. So if you start with that, you, you can quickly start to prove or disprove your business model before you spend money building up all the automated uh, and uh, if you realize that uh, there are no users, then you just save yourself, you know, hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand uh, dollars, not building something that you, and that money can be uh, used to now make new experiments, try new things. That uh, don't try not to build from multiple. I, I mentioned this earlier in the earlier session. Try not to build from uh, multiple platforms in day one. Uh, make sure you build from one platform uh, to. Uh, and figure out all the nuances, how people are going to use it, so that you evolve the features. And once you find the right, right product market fit, then say you start with iOS, then you start to throw the same features for Android, and the same features for the web and all the other platforms. Um, the, the thing is, you build from day one multiple platforms, the moment you get feedback from the user, you're going to have to change the code in all the platforms. So it's gonna, if you're on four different platforms, it's going to cost you four times as much, as much to change everything. Uh, expensive domain names. You'd be surprised how frequently this happens. I talked to a startup, you know, they're like, uh, we raise, you know, fifty thousand uh, dollars. We're gonna, we want to have this fancy domain name, so we're gonna spend forty thousand dollars buying the domain and ten thousand dollars on the domain. Yeah, mistake. Um, this startups happen all the time. You know, we get, you know, uh, you know, get a, you know, get a different name. That might not be your ID name. If your ID name is taken. Uh, try something first, and then when you're successful, you're able to raise money. Then you can have the cash, uh, the, the, the war chest, to actually go out and buy the domain and change the company name. Uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, companies change names quite often. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, don't, don't spend money on fancy offices. You see, if you watch Silicon Valley in the show, you know, they have all these fancy offices, and you know, uh, what they don't realize is they're actually burning investors' money. Uh, do not build an expensive sales and marketing team yet uh, before you're ready. Uh, after you've proven your concept, then it makes sense. You know, once, once you're on a scaling phase, uh, having you know, build up a, a strong sales team, PR team, and things actually very vital to, to scale the business. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, we have less than five minutes. Uh, any, I'm going to open up the floor to any questions. Yes, sir. Oh, you saw our website. We forget to build a feature to implement the top every day. <laughs> it's, it's a little inside the joke uh, because I am uh, crazy over ramen. So every day lunch, uh, my colleagues will never allow me to suggest a place because they know I build the ramen by So that's a little inside the joke on our website.
Ja. Uh, it's a good question. I actually, uh, you know, I have a bunch of discussions with uh, VCs and investors and other companies before. Uh, you know, uh, simple, recognizable names, you know, in branding is very important. It helps. But the thing is, before, uh, you know, uh, before you prove your, your product, uh, maybe you don't need to start with that. You know, you want to prove your product first, then later uh, work on the branding. Yeah. Do I change my name because I have S, B, or a N? Yeah, you can come up with any other name. You know, like, there's no waste much time thinking about the right domain name or the, the paying too much of the domain name. Focus on the product. Basically, you know, as a startup, you have to make very, very limited cash. Even if you raise a lot of money, you have no idea how fast people burn money. You know, I, I have some guys that are burning over a million dollars a month, and that's scary. The burn rate is extremely scary. Uh, and especially when you're not able to, you know, uh, you know, bring in the revenue to make up for that. So you need to be very disciplined on what you spend money on. And when, at the beginning, when money is tight, uh, yeah, buying the medium is something that doesn't advice. But it meant to do that. Yeah.
gets affected by macroeconomic cycle like recession. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of running a startup is that uh, everything that can go wrong, you can, can go wrong and does go wrong. And every day you wake up, uh, yesterday you think that you finally managed to put things in a stable state, and you wake up the next day, everything falls apart again. That happens in life, that's why it's so stressful to be an entrepreneur. And you never you don't understand the stress until you, you've actually done it. Then you can relate to all these other entrepreneurs, you know, why they have so much grey hair after doing startup for a year. It's actually, you know, every day we are solving problems and uh, new problems come all the time. So you cannot, so the only way is to, to, to be defensible against that is to, like I said, you know, take calculated risks, take small risks, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, and then uh, when things go wrong, when the economy change, be ready to pivot. Make sure your team is agile so that you can quickly and easily pivot to a new direction in the US.